you have found a design video for the UWS-4 Ultralight Airplane from the Ultralight Airplane Workshop. In this video, we're going to decide on the landing gear for the airplane. To help us out in deciding on our landing gear and designing it, we're using a book called Simplified Aircraft Design for Home Builders from Dan Raymer. And the part of the book that we're using is Chapter 4, and there's a section in there titled The Rubber Hits the Road. Now, this happens to be Part 2 of Chapter 4, and we're calling the Chapter 4 Stuffing, since he calls Chapter 4 Stuffing in the Stuff. Now, if you're fairly new to the channel and you haven't seen the other design videos, I'm going to put a link up here in the upper right-hand corner that will take you to a playlist for the other videos in this design series. Now, let's get to it. If you've been watching these videos, you know what I'm just getting ready to say, and that's that this video series is not a substitute for Dan's book. Now, you will occasionally find more information in this video than Dan provides. I use some other sources but there's a lot of Dan's book that I don't use. Something that I've left out in these videos might be critical for your design. So I would recommend that you go and get Dan's book. Now there's a link down in the description that will take you to the Ultralight Airplane Workshop's webpage, in particular a webpage where there are links to books that you can get that I frequently use. And one of those links will be to Dan's book. Now if you use the link to buy that book, the Ultralight Airplane Workshop will get a small cut of that sale. So real quickly, let's review what we talked about in part one of the stuffing series. Now in part one, we talked about the design of the cockpit. And the main thing that we worked on there was the angle of the seat pan and the angle of the seat back. And we used some recommendations for some EAA articles to do that and what Dan told us to look at. So we tried to find a comfortable knee angle. We tried to find a good position for the instrument panel where we could see over it and see lots of the runway or lots of what we're going to be flying toward. But we didn't want the bottom of the instrument panel to be so low that it was uncomfortable to look at. And we also figured out the control stick position. Well, now let's get on to what we're going to talk about in this video. Now, the section in Dan's book that we're using starts at page 45. And let's go over real quickly what we're going to be talking about in this video. We're going to talk about how to get the tire size, and there's a couple of ways we can do that. We're going to talk about what kind of shock absorption we're going to use. We need to determine if we're going to use tricycle or conventional gear. And then the type of gear that we choose will decide where the main gear is going to be. And part of deciding that is the tip angle and the center of gravity. Then we'll talk about what the overturn angle is. And then lastly, we'll talk a little bit about the design of the tail wheel or nose wheel, depending on if we decide on tricycle or conventional gear. Let's start with determining the tire size. There's a couple ways of doing it, and both are perfectly valid. And by the way, we're talking about tire size for the mains, not the nose wheel or tail wheel yet. So one way to do it is to look at tires on planes that are similar to the one you're building and then pick those tires, maybe an average or maybe if you think you're going to have a little more weight, you might pick a slightly bigger tire. Or if you're looking for reduced drag, you might use a slimmer tire. So I went online and looked at a, just a couple of data points. Now for the Mini Max, there are several different tires you can get. One is 13 inches in diameter and one is 15 inches in diameter. That's a pretty big tire. But of course, if you're going to build a pretty heavy airplane, that would make sense. I also looked at the pilot shop for some ultralight airplane tires. Now they had two different widths that were 10 inches in diameter. They had another 15 inch diameter tire, which is fairly similar to this other Minimax tire. And then also Aircraft Spruce had ultralight airplane tires and that's 11 inches in diameter. Let's see if that matches the statistical slash analytical method for figuring out your tire size. Now Dan mentions the analytical method you can find in his book, Aircraft Design, a Conceptual Approach. And so he's got an equation here for doing those calculations. Now, our airplane, or ultralight, comes closest to falling into the general aviation category. He has other categories like fighters and twin engine airplanes. So general aviation comes closest to us. So here's the equation, which is an A value multiplied by the gross weight value raised to the power of this B value. And for general aviation airplanes, we've got these numbers for A and B. Now, our gross weight, which I believe was from part two of the aero design, came out to be 517 pounds. So if we plug that in, we get a diameter of 13.36 inches. So that kind of falls in the middle of what we've seen here. Now, he also says if you're going to be on unpaved runways, that you should probably increase that diameter by 30%. Lots of ultralights operate off of unpaved runways, but they're fairly decent grass runways. So I don't know if this 30% applies to more backcountry flying, where you're landing on completely unprepared areas, or 
but the difference would be for a nice prepared grass runway. Now we have to live with whatever tires are available on the market. So I'm going to have to pick something in this area up here. There are a few other options, but something like this. And I think it's kind of interesting that this 13 inches lines up with one of these Minimax tires. So at the moment, I'm leaning towards a 13 inch diameter tire, one of these Minimax tires. The next thing that Dan talks about on his book on simplified aircraft design is shock absorption. Now, if you've been around ultralights very much, you know that there are lots of models of ultralights that do not have any sort of shock absorption except the tires themselves and a slight flex in the airplane frame itself. And that's going to be examples like the Ultra Cruiser, the Quicksilver MX, Weed Hopper, but there are others that do have some shock absorption, and that's frequently things like the Cub Style, that'd be like the N3 Pup, and then there are others that have sprung gear, so the gear itself acts a little bit like a spring. Now I've kind of worked myself into a corner a little bit with the earlier part of the aerodynamic design. When I chose the inverted V-tail and then the twin boom to hook that to the rest of the airplane, I kind of added some extra weight because of that twin boom arrangement. So I'm going to be a little bit heavy just because of that. And that I'll actually bring up another thing that's going to add some weight we'll talk about here in a minute. Since I've kind of worked myself into a weight corner, I think to start with, I'm not going to do any shock absorption. I know that ultralight airplanes can be successful without shock absorption. And my airplanes modeled a lot on the Ultra Cruiser, which does not have any shock absorption. So to save weight, I'm not going to do anything extra, but what I'm interested in trying in the future is maybe some rubber donuts either up in the wing where the landing gear leg goes, or maybe down in the landing leg tube itself, and see if I can at least get a little bit of shock absorption without adding weight. But of course, I've got to have the weight margin available in order to do that. So I'm going to put that off into the future. I also have some other ideas that I'm going to have to do some experimentation on. But unfortunately, my ideas would be even heavier, so I'm going to have to put those off even farther. Well, now we need to figure out what type of a gear we're going to use, which is tail dragger, frequently called conventional gear, or tricycle gear. Well, like I said in the last slide, I got myself into a little bit of a weight issue, potentially. So I'm going to have to pick the lighter type of gear, and that's generally tail dragger. So let's talk about what the typical arrangement is going to be. On a tail dragger, you've got two main wheels and then a wheel back on the tail. So when you're sitting on the ground, you're sitting on those three wheels. In the tricycle gear, you still have your main wheels, but you also have a nose wheel. And typically that nose wheel is gonna be fairly large, much larger than a tail wheel would be. So typically your tricycle gear is gonna be heavier than your conventional or tail dragger gear. So I'm gonna select tail dragger, at least for this version of the airplane. In the future, we might switch to tricycle gear. I'm actually going to be a little bit heavier with my tail dragger than a typical tail dragger would be since we've got those twin booms and we'll have to attach tail wheels to those twin booms. So that's going to be two tail wheels instead of the typical one. Now one nice thing about that though is it gives us a wider stance there on the tail which is going to reduce the likelihood of tipping to the side on a really hard taxiing turn but we're going to have just a little more weight. Now, even with two tail wheels, I think we'll have less weight than a nose wheel would be. Nice thing about the tail dragger configuration is we should have a little bit less drag because that nose wheel would generally have more drag than a tail wheel. But again, we're gonna have two tail wheels. So in that case, I'm not sure which would have more drag. I'm still thinking that a large nose wheel would give more drag than two smaller tail wheels. That I'm not quite sure about though. And another thing I should mention, I'll go ahead and mention it here. Dan mentions it at the end of his section is, this will not be retractable gear, this is gonna be fixed gear. And then another thing I kinda of like about the tail dragger is that when you're getting in and out of the airplane, it doesn't change its attitude, it doesn't change its angle on the ground. Whereas with most tricycle gear ultralights that are pusher configuration, when you're not in the airplane, it's actually resting on its tail. But when you get into it, it then comes down and rests on its nose wheel. And of course, when you get out, the nose wheel pops back up off the ground and it rests on the tail wheel. I'm not really fond of that. It's not a big deal, but I like that with a tail dragger, your airplane's nose is not popping up and down as you get in and out. Now there is one significant drawback to the tail dragger configuration, and that's because you are less stable than the tri-gear configuration. For tricycle gear, the main contact with the ground is gonna be behind your center of gravity. That's a more stable situation than with tail dragger, where your main gear is actually in front 
of the center of gravity. That is an unstable situation. That center of gravity wants to be in front of that main contact point. So you're more likely to get what's called a ground loop with a tail dragger. But of course you could overcome that by having really good rudder skills at low speed. Well, we still need to know exactly where to place that main gear. And Dan does a pretty good job of talking about what you need to do in order to get that main gear in the right position. Now that position, of course, grossly depends on whether you're a tricycle gear or tail dragger. Since we're a tail dragger, we know our landing gear is going to be in front of the CG, but where's that CG? Well, we're going to get to that in a minute. First, we need to look at the angle of our airplane when we're landing. Now, Dan mentions that typically that's going to be somewhere between 10 and 15 degrees. And that's relative to the angle that you're going to be at cruise. At cruise, we're going to call that zero degrees. At landing, you're going to be nose up somewhere between 10 and 15 degrees, somewhere less than your stall angle. Now, when we were working on our design, we kind of cut that in half and we chose 12 and a half degrees. And you'll remember that when we were doing the tail geometry video, we wanted to make sure our tail was above that 12 and a half degree line so we wouldn't have our tail striking the ground when we're landing. The well, next thing that Dan does is help us out by telling us what the angle should be from our center of gravity down to where the main gear touches the ground. So he says that touch point should be 16 degrees from the most forward CG that you're going to allow. And this is to help prevent us from tipping over forward for a tail dragger configuration. It's one of the things we got to worry about is that we're going to get our tail too high and tip over on our back. And then for the aftmost CG, you want the angle between that CG and our touch point of the main gear to be around 25 degrees. And we don't want this angle to be too large. If it's too large, we're going to have a difficult time getting the tail off the ground when we're trying to take off. Well, unfortunately, at this point in our design, we have not looked at where our CG is going to be. We have absolutely no idea. <laughs> so having these degree points is nice, but without these CG points, we don't know where to have that touch point be for the main gear. Now here's something that Dan doesn't talk about in this section. One of the things you do is get a good estimate for where that aft CG is going to be. Now in order to do that, I decided to use Chris Hines' book, Flying on Your Own Wings. And he's got an equation in there for a low wing airplane, which is what we are. And this equation here shows you where your aft CG is going to be relative to the mean aerodynamic cord. So if you plug in things like the surface area of the horizontal tail, surface area of your wing, the length from the mean aerodynamic cord of your wing to the mean aerodynamic cord of your horizontal tail, and then divide that by the aerodynamic cord of your wing, you plug all that in, and that'll give you this value here, which is how far back on the mean aerodynamic cord that aft CG would be. And we've determined all these values on previous videos. For example, the mean aerodynamic cord of the wing is about 5.2 feet. The surface area of the wing is 121 square feet. And that's all in part four of the aerodynamic design. The length on the tail is 13 and a half feet, well, 13.6 feet. Now we're using an inverted V tail. So we have to use the equivalent surface area of a horizontal tail for that. And that's 21 square feet. And you can get all that in part 6B of the aerodynamic design. So we plug all that in and we find out that the aft CG is going to be at 33.65% of the mean aerodynamic cord of the wing. Now we've got a Hershey bar wing, which means the cord's constant along there. So the mean aerodynamic cord is the same as the cord of the wing. And that is 1.745 feet back from the leading edge of the wing. So with this value then, and it's 25 degrees, we can get a touch point for the main gear. Well, let's go ahead and pop up OpenVSP. And by the way, OpenVSP is an application that we've been using to visualize the design for our airplane. And let's go ahead and plug this information in that and see what we have. Here's the current aerodynamic configuration of the UWS-4 ultralight airplane. And just as a quick review, here's our cabin. Our pilot sits in here. Here's the main wing. By the way, we're looking from the left side. Here's the ailerons, here's flaps, here's the boom connecting the inverted V-tail. Here's the view from the top, and here's a view from the front. Well, first thing we need to stick in here is our 12 degree line for when we're landing. So that will represent the ground when we are in our landing attitude. We want to make sure we don't hit any other part of the airplane when we're landing. So we're gonna need some clearance between the airplane parts and the ground and we'll need some clearance between our propeller and the ground. Now these flaps are gonna be hinged on the bottom and when they drop down for landing, let's say they come down to about a 30 degree angle, they're gonna come down to about here. 
and I would like to have at least an 8 inch clearance between the bottom edge of the flaps when they're deployed and the ground. So let's use that as our starting spot for where to put that 12 degree line. So here's our 12 degree line with the flaps deployed down to about here. We got a little over 8 inches, so probably a little closer to 10 inches of space between the trailing edge of that flap when it's deployed and the ground. So that looks pretty good. Now let's stick in our prop and look at the clearance there. So here's our prop, this vertical line here. So again, where I put that initial spot for that 12 degree line looks pretty good for clearance for the prop. Now let's stick in what we think will be the location for our aft CG. So this little sphere here is where I think the CG is going to be, the aft one. It is 33% of the mean aerodynamic cord back from that leading edge. Then I drew a 25 degree line from vertical through that CG down to where it intersects this 12 degree line. So right here is where our main gear for our tail dragger should be. Well now we need to find out if that 16 degree line, the forward center of gravity, is going to work for us. I do not have an equation for calculating that forward center of gravity. So let's work backwards to get it. Let's put in a 16 degree line that intersects down here in the same spot that this 25 degree line does. Then we'll come up here at the same height that this CG is, the aft CG, and we'll stick in a forward CG. And then we'll find out where that is in relation to the mean aerodynamic cord. We'll find out if we like that or not. Well, here's our 16 degree line. It comes down to our little touch point. Here's the tire. That's a, I believe a 12 inch tire instead of 13 inch, but it'll stand in perfectly fine. So based on this 16 degree line and using the same height we did on the aft CG, this is where our forward CG would be. Now while we use an open VSP's measure utility, we can figure out how far that is after the leading edge and then we can calculate the percent of mean aerodynamic cord that is. Let's do that. So I used to open VSP's measurement utility to measure from the leading edge of our wing to that forward CG, the CG that's on that 16 degree line. And that turned out to be 1.03 feet. Now what percentage of that is that of the mean aerodynamic cord? So we divide that 1.03 by the cord of our wing and we get roughly 19.9%. That is really way forward. So our risk of tipping over forward when we're landing or putting on the brakes or we hit a ditch is fairly low. Still can happen, but it's actually going to be pretty low. I'm very pleased about that. This roughly 20 degrees for the forward CG, I probably would never actually fly that far forward. I really want to fly with the CG close to the 25% cord. That will typically give us our lowest trim drag. If I'm going to end up having that CG farther forward, let's say up around 20, then we're actually asking that horizontal portion of our tail to push down even harder to counteract that CG being so far forward. And I really don't want to do that. But at least we know if we should somehow get up there, we're less likely to tip over forward. So I've stuck a landing gear leg in here, and there's a little axle down here, although the axle's not quite the right position. It should be up here just a little bit. So let's go back and talk a little bit about shock absorption. So the tire is intended to absorb some of the shock. Now the amount that it can absorb is pretty limited. But one of the things that's kind of nice about this forward tilted gear, and by the way, it will be attached to the main spar, which will be right in here somewhere. So I'll have a little bracket welded to this leg that then bolts to the spar. But one thing that's kind of nice with this tube here especially when we're landing, because it's going to be out a little bit farther because the tail's down, is that this landing gear can absorb some of that shock. Now the way that it would absorb that shock is that the leg will bend in this direction. Let's talk about landing. Landing will be horizontal along this line. So when we hit the ground, the force is going to be perpendicular to this ground line. So it'll be in this direction here. Now we can divide that force up into two parts. One part would be a force going straight up the leg. That'd be a compression force. The other force would be going 90 degrees to that. So straight out this way. So the force this way will cause this tube to try to bend the end like this, out this direction. That will help absorb some of that landing energy. 
And by the way, I am ignoring a couple things. For example, the force that's going to be incurred when we spin up this wheel, that would actually cause a force backwards, parallel to the ground. I'm also ignoring any sideway force. For example, you'd have that if we weren't lined up straight up and down the runway, we were yawed left to right, that would cause a sideway force. I'm going to ignore that for the moment too. But we have to be careful and not try to make this landing gear too springy. In other words, I don't want it to bend up too far forward. Because if we do, we could actually have some other problems. Because what I'm thinking about, let's show it here. What I'm thinking about is using a leg that comes down on one side of the wheel instead of having a fork. Because that can also absorb just a little bit of shock. It'll cause this tube to bend in a little bit when we land. But again, we can't let it be too flexible. Because if it is too flexible, we could actually have this tube do a twist. Where this wheel is no longer tracking straight. It could track inward or outward. So that's something we got to watch out for. Well, the next thing that Dan talks about is the overturn angle. Now, the overturn angle is the angle between the CG and the landing gear, but looking laterally instead of fore and aft. And we'll look at a nice picture of that that explains it a little bit better in a moment. But that overturn angle is going to determine how likely it is that you're going to tip sideways in a crosswind or a really sharp taxiing turn. Now he says that angle should be somewhere between 25 degrees and 63 degrees. Let's go see what our angle is. And no cheating look into this yet. Again, here's our front view of our airplane. This little blue sphere in here is our CG sphere. These lines here are the overturn angle lines. So from where the tire touches up to that CG. Now, as you might imagine, if the tires are farther inboard and the angle is something like 25 degrees, you're far more likely to tip over sideways when you're making a really hard taxiing turn or if you're in a pretty hard crosswind. And the further out your tire is, the less likely you are to tip over. But <laughs> the farther out that tire is, the more likely you're going to have some interesting steering issues. For example, or you run off the edge of the strip where you got tall grass on one tire and short grass on the other tire, you're more likely to have an issue with the ground loop. That's why he put a limit of 63 degrees on how far out it goes. Well, right now, our tires are at 42 and a half degrees for the overturn angle. I kind of like that. That's kind of in between these two values. I think that's going to work pretty well. So we're going to stick with that. Well, next thing to talk about are the tail wheels. Now, I already mentioned I plan to have one tail wheel on each boom. But the problem with that is I'm going to have twice as much weight in tail wheel than most other airplanes would with a single tail wheel. Another thing that talks about whether you're going to have a steerable tail wheel or a castering tail wheel. And again, in order to save weight, I'm going to have a castering tail wheel. That pretty much requires that I'm going to have the brakes on the main gear of this airplane. And they can be actuated individually. And we'll use that for steering. So when you want to turn right, you lock up the brake on the right main gear. Or not necessarily lock it up, but apply some brakes on the right main gear. And vice versa. And that's been used for years and years. That works pretty well. Now, I didn't mention it in any of the previous videos, but from the get-go, I definitely want to have brakes. I've flown ultralights that don't have brakes, and I do not like that at all, particularly if you get on a paved runway. Number one, paved runways and taxiways and even some ramps can have a slight angle to them. And sometimes it's going to be pretty darn hard to get stopped if you don't have brakes. And if you have a wind pushing you, a strong wind, you can be in deep trouble too. So for me, brakes are required. And since I'm going to have brakes and I can use those for steering, I can do away with steering on the tailwheel. So here's the view of our airplane with the landing gear. Here's the tail gear. This is our 12 degree landing line. So this would be the ground when we're taxiing. Now let's come in here and look at this tailwheel just a little bit more. Talk about something that Dan talked about. So I put a yoke around this tail wheel. You'll notice it is not horizontal with the ground in our ground taxi position. It's actually tilted down five degrees. There will be a little bit of a swivel here that is going to be tilted five degrees from vertical. And that will give us a negative rake for this castering tail wheel. Now I didn't draw all that in here. It's kind of a pain to do. We'll do that in CAD later. But you can see that there's a yoke that goes around it, there'd be a pin through the axle, and it'll swivel around that five degree raked pin. Now that negative rake is to help keep this wheel in trail 
when we're moving forward. Now naturally, if we end up moving backward a little bit, this would try to swivel around. So we'll probably have to move this connecting pipe up just a little bit higher so that the tail swivels around and won't be hitting the pipe. But really, that's just about all there is to this tail wheel. Well, at the moment, that's pretty much it for the landing gear. There's lots of details we still need to figure out. It's good enough to get a rough weight estimate that we're going to have to do here in the near future. If you like this video, please consider hitting this thumbs up button down in the description area of the video. That makes it more likely that YouTube will suggest this video to other people that might have similar interests. If you'd like to help out the Ultralight Airplane Workshop channel, a free way to do that and an easy way to do that is to hit that subscribe button if you haven't done that already. And to make sure you're notified when new videos come out, make sure this bell symbol is turned on. It's right beside the subscribe button. What are we going to work on next? Well, next thing in Dan's chapter four is putting in the engine. So you got to figure out a little bit more about where it's going to be placed, how much volume it's going to take up, how we're going to cool it, and some similar things. Well, guys, that's it. Thanks for watching. Until next time.